What if I don't see the catchphrase, huh? What are you gonna do about it? Ugh, sorry, I'm just kinda torn. These are fun, and this is the end. I'm excited to move on to new things after this, but it's the worst kind of farewell. The kind where I have to say nice things about the wizard. So settle in, class, we got a lot of ground to cover. Mostly in the 11 subclasses, the wizard itself is nothing. Do I really need to describe it? If you've even heard of magic, you probably have a good idea. And no, that's not because they're superior, it's because they're writing most of the books. C6 hit die, can't use armor or tools or even weapons outside what the average kid could. Your magic's in a book which can be destroyed, so make a backup. Bright side, you get two more spells per level and can learn as many as you can afford to rank. So with money and time, you can learn two-thirds of all spells ever discovered. At level 18, you can cast two weak spells infinitely, and at 20, you can choose two third level spells to always be prepared with one free use. Everything else is a subclass, with new features at level 2, 6, 10, and 14. Wait, what? Why are we starting at level 2? The subclass is always at level 3 unless it's vital to start with it like the Warlock. Did Watsy just want to make him feel more special? Would make sense, that's kind of their thing. There are 27 spells unique to them, and 58 to them in the source room. Guess you don't need features when you have 337 spell options, and if you can afford 50 gold per spell level, you can take everything you find. It kind of makes Blizzard duels like playing a card game for keeps, like if Yu-Gi-Oh kept more of the original manga's tone. Anyway, let's get this show on the road. One more time. You ready? Let's go. Let's start with a standard straightforward one, Evocation. Most of your subclasses are specializations of a specific type of magic. You can still use other types, but your abilities will make use of or invoke the flavor of the school you majored in. All your subclasses will have two level 2 abilities, and the school beast ones will all have one in common. Cut the time and gold spent when copying spells of your school in half. Funnily enough, the ability works best when you don't take spells of your school when you level up. But if there's no spell shop or university around, you probably should. It's mostly there for snagging spells from other people's books. For the Evocation Wizard, your second level 2 ability is Sculpt Spell. You can choose people to automatically take no damage from your area spell if there's a save for half. You know, basically that sorcerer meta magic they have to spend a resource and part of a feature on, only infinite and for free. At level 6, your save for no damage cantrips become save for half. At 10, you add your intelligence mod to one damage roll for your evocation spells, and at 14, you can automatically do maximum damage with spells up to 5th level. You can technically do it as much as you want, but you start taking increasing damage each time as you overtax yourself. Pretty straightforward with evocation, both in subclasses and in spells. It's the school of blasting people with every element. It's energy emission. This is for the wizard that doesn't want to think, they want to make things explode. And you know what, when you're in a profession based in killing things, that's not a terrible mindset. Evocation wizards are the premier battle wizards for that reason. Whether you consider explosions in art and yourself the greatest sculptor, or just one thing's dead with a wave of your wand, evocation's got you covered. However, since it's the most straightforward one, it's harder to find a magician I can't use as an example, so how about we twist something else? The spellbook. Talk with your DM to approve the change, yada yada, but what exactly is that spellbook? I've seen it scrolled on the hilt of a weapon, primal magic written in codes of woven beans, Pockets full of napkin scribbles and an hour of prep was just finding the ones he needed. Perfectly neat tomes do work, of course, or maybe they're embroidered, or runes on a tablet, or a bag of little hand-carved statues that inspire you. And if your DM doesn't want to take away your spell buck, you can get even weirder. Instead of a book, you cloud watch and find the day's spells there, or they're tattooed onto you, or you've got a perfect memory, but if you don't prepare by pacing around repeating them to yourself, you freeze up from panic anyway. Also, your spells take so long to copy because they're all written in unique ways. Maybe yours are written as poetry, your stories, or in stage notation. It's a picture book with things to remind you of people and creatures and how they did it. Maybe it's all incomprehensible memes from your time in wizard school, or fan art collections that invoke the proper feelings. You could even have it being like a diary entry and you're relearning how you first did it. Though you might want that warded, which is what abjuration is all about. I mean, if you're planning on getting into fights, defensive magic just makes sense. It's guards, wards, removing hostile magic. Abjuration wizards gain a damage ward once per day that works as a shield, and they use it by casting any abjuration spell. Twice your level, plus your intelligence mod, and lasts all day, so it's usually active from the start thanks to mage armor. The way it's worded basically makes it a better temporary HP that stacks with temporary HP. You can also have it absorb damage your friends take at level 6. This is especially important because an attack that doesn't break your ward doesn't break concentration, which most magic classes will always be using. At level 10 you gain proficiency in spells like counterspell that require a check, and at 14 you resist all spell damage and have advantage on your saves. Overall it's pretty solid, especially for people who tend to freeze up in combat. Your abilities in most spells are either reactionary or used before battle, which also cuts down on your number of offensive spells. Counterspell proficiency is also amazing, you can shut down enemy casters so consistently. Your main goal in battle is survival because you know that target the caster is one of the first rules of combat. By the way, this school attracts nervous types, so why are you in a dungeon? Are you a scared researcher dragging to battle because dungeons have ancient magic you can study? Maybe you're too poor for magic school so you're adventuring for spells to raid. You know that dungeoneering might be dangerous, but the school of hard knocks teaches quick and you need an edge. Or maybe your party is forcing you in the back because you'd charge headfirst in the battle you think your magic makes you near invincible. You're actually really big and burly, you just became a wizard to shore up your magical resistance. You are a war mage and far more than one of those evocation wizards. Anyone can launch fire 
fireballs from the back lines, you're putting yourself in harm's way to shield against them and shut people down. Of course, the real war wizard is the war wi wizard. The war wizard doesn't specialize. Adaptability is key for a battle tactician. You add your intelligence to initiative instead of the usual magical discount, and when you get hit, you can give yourself a bonus to your AC or the save. The downside is that you can only cast cantrips next turn, but plus four in a save is a lot, especially at this level when saves are like DC 12. Well, plus two AC is not the biggest surge, but it does stack with your level 10, plus two to AC and saves whenever you're concentrating on a spell. You'll almost always be concentrating in battle, so if you start taking heat, just stop doing big spells. You can easily have an effective AC of more than plate mail and a ridiculous save resistance. Plus, you're not too far off from 14, where using that level two ability also makes three people take force damage. Helps make up for your lower damage next turn. While Abjuration's great at keeping the party alive, you're great at keeping yourself alive. The only non-defensive thing you get is level six. Power Surge lets you gain a stack of energy anytime you successfully counter spell or dispel magic. Every stack you burn on a spell adds half your level in damage. You also get one on a short rest if you're out, so it's not entirely useless even if you don't run into enemy mages. This is for the wizard that wants to use all those cool short range spells despite being a glass cannon. I mean, I know I glossed over it, but you have no armor and the lowest HP. Mage armor can help, but you're still not that durable. I would double down on that concept too, be a dwarf or a turtle or something. I'd either go for like a grung or a halfling, someone who needs all the help they can get surviving. And if you're focusing your infinite magical possibilities on one purpose or school, you need to know why. Maybe War Academy was expected of you, or just cheap enough to afford. Or maybe you aren't trained, you're just an old mercenary who can't keep up anymore and is turning to magic to stay useful. You could have nothing to do with war, you're just a merchant who picked up any spell they thought could keep them alive. Maybe you were sent to learn magic as a tactician, but liked fighting too much to stay out of the action. Besides, it's tactical, some of the best spells are close range, and you can take advantage of people getting out of position to attack the wizard who's right there, only to find themselves suddenly surrounded. It's still a dangerous game, if your defense fails you've still got low HP, but it lets you at least play the close range game without instant death. But if you are fine with a risk of death, you just really want to live on that knife's edge, might I interest you in Blade Song? Blade singing is an elven thing, but they remove the restriction in Tasha's. Good, they can have their special toy back when they stop considering multiple apocalypse as a valid cause for an elves only clubhouse. Anyway, Blade Song's for wizards who want to take up a sword and go running into battle. You're proficient in knight armor, which is actually worse than mage armor, and a single type of one handed melee weapon. You also get this special state you can enter called Blade Song. It only lasts a minute and you have to meet your list of requirements and not get knocked out, but it has a host of benefits. You're faster, add intelligence to AC and concentration saves, and have advantage on acrobatics. You can use this state your proficiency times per day, like a barbarian rage for nerds. At level 10, it lets you expend spell slots to reduce incoming damage, and at 14, you add intelligence to your damage as well. Be careful though, because it's all wrapped up in that song. Except for level 6, which lets you attack twice per attack action with the option to replace one with a cantrip. Attacking multiple times per turn is pretty required for a martial class, so it makes sense you have it. Now all that said, you're still taking a gamble on this one. Your AC can get crazy high, but there's plenty of ways around AC. On the sliding scale of subclasses from warrior to caster, you're among the furthest on the caster side. It can be fun to be a wizard who runs and swinging like the rest of the party. Everyone else dabbles in magic, so why can't you dabble in swordplay? Maybe you like studying fitness and combat as a hobby. Or everyone in town knows combat, so even you couldn't escape without something. Sometimes you snap and go into a frenzy of blades, too angry to focus on spell placement and strategy. Or maybe you're just acting out those music back fight scenes you daydream about during long study sessions. You think you're gonna be so cool, you'll be just like those anime sword fighters from the videos, but sometimes you get hit and lose your focus and have to go back to fireball. Or it's just military training and even the wizard needs to know how to use a spear. Though with so many war-focused wizards running around, the smartest thing to go into is probably necromancy. Always plenty of subjects and so much variety in your spells. Blasting, cursing, reviving the dead to normal life, and unlife, astral projection, even some weird healing spells. But as for your necromancer abilities, you get what you came here for. Casting animate dead, getting more skeletons with it, making them stronger and tougher, and at 14 you can take control of wild undead and steal them from other wizards. The smart undead do get a save to break free every hour. You can also do more than just raise undead. At level 10 you resist necrotic damage and can't have your max HP reduced by undead, and at level 2 where you start off you can heal whenever you kill things with a spell. Twice the spell level on health, triple if it was a necromancy spell. I know it doesn't sound like much, but you're gonna have like 9 HP when you get this. Not that much is still a pretty decent amount for you. And look, you can be the cackling evil overlord and have tons of fun. Don't get me wrong, being a villain is great. You can be that cartoon villain who's on the party's side, but only for now, young heroes. There's a difference between being evil and being a jerk, and a lot of DMs who are against evil characters have plenty of those in their campaigns. I think most people are against evil characters because they think they're gonna be disruptive, but I have yet to see a disruptive evil player who wasn't a disruptive hero too. As long as the villain goes along with the party, I see no issue. But forget about the villains, but about the friendly necromancers with flowers in their hair and on their skeletons. The ones who are spreading seeds in their zombies, turning them into walking fertilizer packets. Blue collar workers using them for manual labor and dangerous jobs so people don't get hurt. Picture a society 
society where you can sign up your body to help out in the mines like you'd sign up as an organ donor. Screw what the book says, necromancy doesn't have to be evil. Yeah, it's the study of life, not just on life. Healing spells have changed school in like every edition, but they were originally necromancy and have been that more than any other school. People keep trying to reclassify because they can't handle nuance. Stop turning necromancy into spells that scare me, school. Most spells are just tools with no moral alignment, and the ones that can be used almost exclusively for evil aren't usually in this school. Oh yeah, the skeletons will roam free after 24 hours. Then redo the spell or end them first. Name a long-term spell that won't keep messing with its environment. What machine doesn't keep chugging after your death? And yours can be undone by a passing pig or dairy cow. Anime Dead is mimicking life. It's magical puppetry. People keep saying we're disrespecting the body like they aren't doing the same to animals. The only difference is a sense of self-importance. Some of us are evil, but some of all wizards are evil. At least we're honest and having fun with it. Yeah, not like the enchantment wizards. Not all bad, whatever, but if you're wanting a real evil, that's what you look at. Enchantment isn't really enchanting items like you might expect, it's mostly controlling people's minds and thoughts. You have a few odd spells like Power Word Kill for some reason, but even your host of buffs and debuffs are mostly through muddling minds. As for your abilities, at first you daze someone within 5 feet of you. You can use your actions to keep it going forever and they're incapacitated, but it ends as soon as they're attacked or you're more than 5 feet away. So it's good for freezing something that's about to kill you, but you're basically removing both of you from battle. It's an interesting risk reward play against a boss though. Level 6 is similar, this time making someone attacking you within 30 feet change target. Note that if there's multiple people closest to them, they can choose the target, so you're not usually making them hit their allies. This also fails if they're immune to charm, which is about a fifth of the monsters, so just be aware of that. Same for 14, where you make a target unaware that they were ever charmed, the main drawback of most mind manipulation spells. You can also make your victim forget hours of memories, make them do whatever you want then forget they were ever there, and you'll have plenty of targets because at 10th level your single target enchantment spells target two creatures. Single target is most of your best spells. Forget the mind manipulation, you could infinitely twin power word pain. And look, I'm sorry, but there's no way around like half of these spells just being evil. It's mind manipulation and control. Ripping someone's sense of self away and forcing them to do things they don't want to do is never okay. And even if they did consent, being unable to revoke consent is sketchy as hell. Now the enchantment wizard is strong, absolutely. You can shut down like half the field with some bad rolls, but this hypnosis has no safe word. It's a good thing I allow evil characters because if you're playing one of these, neutrality is a struggle. Do they struggle making friends because they're never sure if their love for you is real? Is your enchanter a master manipulator reveling in their abilities? That's the way I'd run it. Go full super villain manipulating your enemies and forcing them into line. Maybe you're a cutthroat business owner using enchantments to claw your way to the top. The adventuring's just for quick capital after your stores got burned down by a rival. You'll get strong, enact bloody vengeance, then rise again unopposed. And if your DM's fine with you breaking the mold, try out different ways of making these effects. Maybe you use pheromone filled perfume. Or you daze people by teleporting drugs down their throat. Or maybe a bay gave you your spell book and the power to enchant those and look in your eye. And your hour of prep is just stating her with food and conversation. But if total manipulation is giving you a god complex, put it away. The only divine a wizard handles is divining the future. Divination is basically just the school of knowledge. The future, past, languages, relationships, locations of things and people and what they're doing. Divinations have knowledge and with it comes power. Knowledge of the future gives you two d20 rolls at the start of every day. You can then replace basically any d20 roll with that number. I didn't say any of yours. Any roll made by any creature you can see. If you roll high, the paladin gets an at will ultra smite crit. Roll low and the enemy's missing whenever you choose. Mid rolls are a bit more tricky but I find they're best for saves. Your spell DC is good enough that 11's probably not passing unless they are really good at a skill, and a medium roll on something you're good at is usually enough to get by. Those two dice become three at level 14 because it's powerful enough that one use is still a fantastic level 14 ability. But what about more knowledge in the way of so many more spells? Starting at level 6, casting a divination spell makes you regain a spell slot of one level lower, or a fifth level spot if it's level 6 or higher. This means you can use divinations all the time, they barely affect you. Make sure to take mind spikes so you can splash out level 2 spells like cantrips by mid game because they just turn into level 1's for magic missile or silvery barbs. And at level 10, you can save on a few spell slots by getting some utility. Once per day, you can choose to see in the dark, see the invisible, or peer into the ghost dimension. Last until your next rest. I just can't overstate how cool Portin is. But don't forget that you have so many spells, you should always be spying on the next room to know what comes next. Though as useful as it is, why are you studying it? Are you a scholar who actually prefers peering into the past and learn forgotten history? Did you lose someone in an ambush and swear it would never happen again? Are you just power hungry and knowledge is power? And do you find it a curse like so many oracles past? Or maybe you just have a crippling need to be the smartest one in the room, and by knowing what's coming next, you can act like a problem you are given the answer to is super obvious because you're just that smart. I know that's some of you, that's why I've got my attitude towards wizards. I've got nothing against the craft and I look up to quite a few. My admiration towards the school's founder is why I'm here, and Amelia is one of my closest friends. But a lot of them turn that power into elitism, which is one of my most hated traits, bringing down my general opinion. Turns out that thinking you can outsmart physics doesn't tend to make you humble. It could. Maybe you read things in the stars and feel the weight of how cosmically small you are. Maybe you're so desperate to learn and prepare because it makes you feel weak. You're the type with 10 backup plans for every situation. Or maybe you don't know what's going on, you're just guessing based on vibes.
fine. The insanely lucky person foretold by the law of averages to counteract my birth. I've made several people who are against superstition and religion as a concept start believing in petty luck. But if you're looking to make people change, transmutation has got you covered. More in a physical sense though, really useful. Everyone's always hating on them for being weak or whatever, but I've seen a transmutation wizard in action and he was fucking awesome. They just take a little bit to come online. I'll admit that the level 2 ability isn't great. You turn a non-magical object made of iron, copper, silver, wood, or stone into something of a different material. It's useful for scamming people or breaking holes in walls, but the fact that it's 10 minutes really limits its use. Thankfully, you have more abilities, like your level 6 transmitter stone. You have a special rock that can make its older faster, resist a damage type off a list, have proficiency in con saves, or have dark vision. The fact that you can pass this around and change its function when you cast a spell makes it a lot more useful than you might expect. It also gets more functions at level 14, letting you break the stone to raise the dead, make someone look younger, completely heal them while curing curses and such, or transform an object into another object. Having a free raised dead or full heal is wonderful. Oh, and level 10 gives you polymorph and lets you cast a restricted version once per day for free. It's good for travel and scouting. Look, I'm not gonna sit here and say they're the strongest by any means, that's probably divination. And if you're a DM, I'd suggest making a new second level ability or at least reducing the time. But to be fair, with this school, your discounted spell really makes a difference. You can learn 69 transmutation spells and they're the best ones. Sounds of buffs and utility, but also teleportation, flight, breathing fire, shape-shifting, spells like reverse gravity, disintegrate, haste, time stop, and of course my love, my favorite spell, catapult. Launching random items of people is the best. Like, we've been glossing over these spells, but wizards have it all. Transmutation is one of the schools that benefit the most from having creativity at the table. You affect your friends in the battlefield as much as you do your foes. You're a battle tactician molding the field, a scholar of the building blocks of existence, or the type of person who makes things like the owlbear. Whether you're a mad scientist or a humble engineer, transmutation magic is my favorite spell school. Though to be fair, the next two are contenders. If you can handle even more creativity at the cost of physicality, Illusion is for you. Illusion spells are all about misleading, distracting, and invisibility. Though you do have a few damaging spells, sometimes belief is nearly as good. You'd be shocked at what the body can do to make its perception reality. The placebo and nocebo effect are absurdly strong. Now as for the subclass, a creative player will have a field day with a catch. Put a pin in that thought, we'll come back to it. At level 2, you crank up the minor illusion spell to have all of its effects at once. Your illusions can be visual and audible. A crack in the wall with a growling creature, a terrified goblin that actually screams, etc. And it takes an action to even try to disbelieve. And honestly, if it's me running, having both really eliminates most reasons people would even try. And even better, at level 6 you can change your illusion as an action. If you need a different one, you don't have to waste a slot. Now most of these only last 1-10 to 10 minutes, but you can get some use here in a dungeon or crowded area. Especially since you can change the audio, so you can basically have it hold a conversation. And if they try to prove it fake by touching it, at level 14 the illusion can just become temporarily real. Or at least you can make it partially real. Like if you make an illusion of someone climbing a ladder, the ladder can actually be real for a minute. So as you'd expect, your illusion spells are cranked up to 11 here. The only thing not aimed at a spell is your level 10 ability. You can make someone automatically miss their attack against you with an illusion of yourself, and it's once per short rest which is pretty nice. Honestly, it's my favorite defensive ability, since as a wizard you really shouldn't be getting attacked much to begin with. Now let's go back to that part I told you to remember. The illusion wizard can be one of the best of all or the worst by far, and it depends on both you and your DM. Now I don't usually factor this in because if your DM's a jackass, every class is bad. So I'm not calling divination bad just because your DM might refuse to let it work. The thing is, with illusion you can be shut down by a nice DM who's trying to be generous. It really all depends on your expectations, because there's a lot of interpretation in this class and it's their job to balance you. If you're wanting to use this, think of a few example situations to run by them. If you make a little plucking chicken wander near goblins on a stealth mission, how do they react? You've crept into the base of some cultist during a ritual, and since you know who their god is, you create a flaming symbol that speaks. You snapped the bandit's rope bridge and made an illusory copy, things like that. Some DMs will revel in it, embellish it, or at least give you a chance unless the situation's far-fetched. You're gonna have a great time with those ones. Some, however, will absolutely not. Some will have everyone immediately roll to disbelieve everything or fight you tooth and nail on every limit. Don't roll illusion with them because your limit isn't your creativity. It's how well the two of you can meet in the middle. And this goes with a lot of classes of course. Anything that's based in creativity or interpretation. Communication is key because what's obvious or sensible to one of you won't always be for the other and you won't know where that line is until you find it. And I find it's better to find it when workshopping than mid-session. But if you want less DM leeway and more tangibility, allow me to interest you in conjuration. Flip the script on the DM because this is the one with all the summons. But even without bogging down the action economy, you can summon nine tentacles, clouds of fire, teleport by summoning yourself. You start by being able to summon an object of your choice, up to 3 feet tall and glowing. It's good for items you don't have in hand and fun to use as a visual aid. At level 6 you can teleport 30 feet, potentially swapping with a willing creature. It also recharges whenever you cast a conjuration spell, so feel free to swap with your fighter. At level 10 you can't lose concentration on a conjuration spell due to damage, and you should always have a concentration spell up because why else are you playing this wizard? Especially when your summons get 30 extra HP at level 14, which is the HP boost from upcasting at 3 levels, so pretty solid. But despite that, you don't have to be summon based. There's all sorts of fun you can have with Conjuration. Be battlefield control with all your hazards and debuffs. Combine that with Epication for maximum area of effectiveness or Abjuration to be 
impossible to put down. Divination and enchantment can help you tangle them up, and if you're constantly making real summons, I personally wouldn't have my monsters even check for your illusions. Here at the end, I want you to remember that you still get all your spell schools no matter your specialization, though of course you would still be remiss to ignore your summons. Be a ringmaster with spectacular summons and amazing illusions to boggle the mind. A rogue scientist using spirit summons to workshop new ideas. The kind who's trying to invent the next owlbear. Do you have monster bits and little biles that grow into summons when magically shattered? Wooden carvings, plush toys, a bonsai tree that grows fruit in the shape of the creature. You mold a piece of clay, or your drawings come to life, or you smash screeching stardust into shape. Maybe you have origami summons that fold into the real deal like our founder. That sort of fun is why I'm here. The person behind Goblin Yu was a conjuration and transmutations of fun. The great Cornelius Archibald the Verdant, or as more commonly introduced. Hello, I am a wizard. Humility. Being two of my favorite spell types, of course I got drawn in, especially with his illustrious pedigree and a name like Goblin Yu. Thought I'd be accepted, maybe get into the apprentice program. Wouldn't if I could now, knowing his protege. Don't made your heroes, they might be semi-lucid and controlled by an evil secretary, mage, kobold, creature. Anyway, speaking of my boss, the scribe's wizard. What, so the one wizard counts as multiple scribes? Last I checked, that boss isn't a legion. She's not, right? Nope. Okay, good. So, not being a school-based class means your level 2 gets real features, instead of that usual reduced time and gold spent by half when copying spells of your school. That feature instead gets moved to level 10, but it's for making spell scrolls and comes with a free second level spell slot in the most convoluted way possible. Anyway, level 2 you get a special book and quill. The quill has infinite ink of every color, lets you erase anything you write with it, and reduces the copy time of spells from hours into minutes. The book lets you cast a ritual spell, normally 10 minutes, as an action once per day. It also lets you change the damage type of a spell into the same as any other spell you have at that level. So if you know Ray of Frost and Burning Hands, you can swap their damage, make Burning Frost and Ray of Hands. Please don't. Honestly, I really love it, and lets even spells you don't care about still be a reward. Also, if your book gets lost or destroyed, or killed I guess since it is sentient, just prepare a new book to use as a host and it comes right back with all your spells. The fact that it's sentient also matters since at level 6 it can basically manifest a little hologram. A person, book, a literal wall of text, more if your team's not a stickler. It can float around using your bonus action, you can share your sights and sounds, and a few times a day you can even cast your spells through it. You can make your close range spells into long range or just shove it under the door for a preemptive strength. Enchantment plus telepathy can hijack a social encounter from outside the building. And at level 14, it gets even better. You have advantage on all arcana checks when you have the book, and when it spirits out, you can survive anything. You can completely negate all incoming damage, no matter the source or amount, at a cost. You burn your spirit's form and roll 3d6. You then lose that many spell levels worth of spells. If you don't have that many spells, lose them all and drop to zero. They leave your book for 1d6 days and you can't relearn them or even cast them. That's just, it's so... You okay? The scribes is my favorite, okay? It always has been. They're the coolest. The other schools feel like a tool for the wizard's interest, but this one feels like experimentation and that's what I'm all about. And that final ability, negating anything with a ward so strong it tears the knowledge from your soul? There's nothing cooler than big magic at a cost. That's like my favorite thing. They have the best stuff and they're the logical choice for any curious mage. And when I finally meet one, it's our jerk up a boss. And one of the worst people I know is one of the coolest things I know. So how about ideas on how to be a good one? First of all, think back like 20 minutes ago. Remember what I was saying about alternative spell books? That goes so much more here. It could be the skull of an ancestor whispering secrets or an endless scroll dating back millennia or made from dragon hide that actually houses the dragon spirit. And on that note, the book's sentient. Who is this? Is this a person or a bound elemental or a wizard who wanted to keep learning for eternity? Is this the spirit of magic itself wanting to learn, explore, experiment? I know that's what the boss thinks it is, but what if it's yourself, a reflection of your spirit, your desire to learn, your curiosity all manifest? I mean, if I hadn't become an alchemist, which was the right choice, but if not, I think I'd be a starry-eyed scribe wizard, just making my janky homebrew magic on a page instead of a pot. With people are similar in all the right ways except a few, you either love each other or hate each other more than anything in the world. I don't exploit employees. Moving on. Now, I have three more things to say. First is the usual end of class summary. Obviously, wizards are a fun class, they're well beloved for a reason, they have absurd amounts of spells, if you're in it for the magic, it's hard to argue with the wizard. But if you're wanting an interesting twist, sorcerer and bard are good for similar levels of magic with a different feel. Druid's great if you want to make it even more complicated by mixing animal forms in, and I recommend the alchemist for a wonderful play for unique magic at the cost of spell power. Secondly, a word of advice for all classes. Always remember that the only true suboptimal pick is the one that isn't fun for you, because then you're failing the entire point of the game, the only part that matters. If the big numbers are what's fun for you, then that's great, but if it's just taking what's cool, also great. Remember, if the party starts hitting above the rate class, the DM will just move into the next weight class. They're not gonna outgun a goddess in an arms race. I am not saying that being strong is evil. Don't drag down other players on purpose. But if they're mad you took a lightning bolt over fireball or something, they're a dick. Fuck them, if you have fun with the way of four elements bunk, they can deal with it. A good DM will just adjust. Assuming it's not some open world where it's established at the start that picking your challenges is on you. There's nothing wrong with that style, it's just not my preferred one. Anyway, there's a reason I only ever mentioned power when I thought it would really affect your experience. The flavor and feel, to me, that's what matters most. Oh, and third, 
what comes next? I mean, we're at the end of my main series here, and I said I was shifting my focus after. I'll probably splash back into monster videos, and you know I cover multiple systems at once. I might stay with monsters if you want, or shuffle in some Pathfinder ancestries. Trust me, they are wild. By B people will find things for your own campaigns, even if you don't make the switch. Or I could do classes if people want me to, though I'll have to figure out how to tackle them. They have less in the way of universal powers, instead giving you a bunch of class-specific options to choose from when you level. But I'll figure it out and write about monsters in the meantime. What I don't need to figure out is my appreciation for all of you, including of course my lovely patrons, Feral Goblin, Modern Masquerade, Snake Oil, but also for all of those in the past. It's not like I've forgotten about Level 1 Cleric or Sergeant Daniels or Elden Year 95 or all of you commenting. I look forward to your comments and all of your ideas. I still think about you and recognize basically all of you by name. I have an oddly good memory for usernames and profile pics. And to those who don't comment or even like, hey, still thanks. You like me enough to get this far in a video, what else could I ask for? Thanks for the ride everyone, here's to many more. Until next time, class dismissed.